Hi, Jeff Frick here in the Palo offices of Silicon Angles, the Cube. Uh, we're here for a Cube conversation. We like to do these every now and then, get updates from, from some of our, our friends, find out what's going on, and we're really excited to have Noam Shandar in, the COO of Zadar Storage. Zadar is really uh, doing well, and, and we just saw you most recently, I believe, at AWS Summit in San Francisco. Right. So good to see you again. You too. So I was just joking, uh, doing a little bit of background before the interview here. Um, you know, there's no such thing as an overnight sensation. We first talked to you way back in AWS Summit San Francisco 2013, so right. it feels like suddenly these guys are just kicking tail, but you've been at this for a little while. Yes. So yeah. talk about how the market has changed, really, as you know, your product development has changed and your maturity, now you're going to market, you're getting a lot of customers, but talk about the change in kind of the attitudes of cloud and the attitude about AWS specifically mm -hmm. and how that really has morphed over what is amazingly mm -hmm. two or three years. Yeah, so there a couple of things have happened, it's, and it's kind of interesting. So one is, yes, when we started, it was very difficult to convince customers to move it to the cloud. So we had to go into the cloud and find who's already there and, and sell to them, whereas now it's not even a question. So we've, we've, we as an industry have cleared that hurdle. Nobody's asking why cloud or, or you know, is it safe enough, is it good enough? Right. Um, the, uh, but the other thing that's super interesting is exactly a year ago, we announced our on-premises service, and that's flying off the shelves, which tells you that as awesome as cloud is, there's still a huge market on premises. It could be it could be things that aren't allowed to move into the cloud, or it could be things that just aren't ready yet. And at least as, as far as we see, it is still a far larger market. So we see, I, I think we're hedging, right? Because we are in both places at the same time. Customers can choose and they can change their mind right. later. So we, we don't really have a strong opinion on which, which is right. Right, but Pat Gelsinger and, and a whole bunch of people have come out, you know, hybrid is the answer, right? There is no absolute mm -hmm. answer. It's all application specific, mm -hmm. application will drive the requirements for the infrastructure as well as the storage being part of that. So exactly. that's not inconsistent, but what's interesting about what you guys do, and maybe we should just let you give a, a quick kind of 411 on Zadar mm -hmm. for people that don't know the company, is is you still use the cloud as a method, as, as, a, as a way of doing business, as a way to deliver your services, even if it's, uh, not actually in a cloud if it's on-prem. That's right. Yeah, so we, we observed when we started, but you know, like you said, it's not overnight success. We've been at it well over four years. We observed in the very beginning that customers like the cloud business model, and it's, and it's not just the business model. It's the ease of use and the simplicity and the lack of headaches. So all of a sudden, the, the burden of ownership is gone. Right. I don't have to worry about maintenance. I don't have to worry about hot fixes or firmware upgrades or anything like that. It goes away. and and yet the product gets better over time just without downtime. So, right. so what we saw is customers were realizing, wait a second, when I use Amazon, life is really easy. Why is this thing that's sitting in my dentist center so difficult? Right. And we saw it and, and succeeded in making a product that is as robust as the traditional data center product, but offered with a pure cloud model, with a with the live upgrades and, and are, are taking care of things behind the scenes so that customers don't have the burden of ownership. And magically, but not magically, through good design, they save money. So, so we usually think of renting a car or, ev or even a having a chauffeured car as being very, very expensive, but our value proposition is it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually have the chauffeured car experience for less than buying the car. Okay, so you covered a lot, a lot of things there. So first off is just kind of the basic cloud mantra, which is you know be elastic, use what you need, when you need, get more when you need it, shut down, make, make it go dark when you don't. And you're delivering on-prem storage capacity with that business model, correct? That's right. It, it, you find people like that. People <laughs> love it. it again, <laughs> they, they obviously love the concept. Their biggest question is, well, what is it going to cost me? Because right, again, right. they're thinking about the rental car, which, right. is, which is more expensive in the long term than buying a car. And well, we, we, we tell them what the, what the price is, and we also now have uh, commissioned a study that shows you say obviously you save money on day one because you haven't purchased anything. Right. But the longer you own it, the more you save. Right. And, and even after ten years, you're still at a fifty percent savings versus the traditional storage. And we get it done two ways. One is as commodity hardware. So it we don't have any component that isn't manufactured in at least tens of millions of units and right. some some in hundreds of millions right. of units. The other is we remotely operate these uh, call them appliances. And we designed these appliances to be easily remotely managed by us, which means that the marginal cost for us to add one more is almost zero. Whereas traditionally, when you buy a piece of storage, a storage array, you have to dedicate a person to that. So we dedicate a small fraction of a person 
And that's a savings, a significant savings versus the total cost of ownership. And we pass those savings on to the customers. And, and that's the part, I guess, that, that you would say, or at least came out of your study, that most people miss about the rent versus own. Because like you said, classic classic uh, kind of thought process would be, yes, I can rent, but at some scale, you know, owning is buyer, I can amortize my cost over over uh, all this business I'm doing and all the utilization, but what gets left off is the operating expense that goes and wraps around the actual hardware. Yeah, absolutely, and by some studies, uh, those, those operating expenses could be half again as much as the cost of the product every year. Right, right, and, and they don't get cheaper like uh, storage tends to do every year. That's right. Yeah, so that's great. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we cover a lot of hot topics. We go to a lot of cool shows. Uh, AWS was super new three years ago, not so much anymore. We're looking forward to going back to reInvent here uh, shortly, but one of the really hot spaces right now is Docker. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we took the cube to DockerCon and it's all about containers and it's just the, kind of this next manifestation of the consumerization of IT and the expected way that, that apps are supposed to work. And a big part of that theme is, like you said, remove all the headache. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my developers just want to get to work and, and build cool apps and deploy cool apps. You guys have some stuff going on with Docker, so I wonder if you can give us an update on what Zadar is doing mm -hmm. with Docker, specifically in containers in general. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so in June we launched what we call Zadara Container Services. And Zadara Container Services, simply put, is Docker running inside the storage. The beauty of that is that now the storage and the computer are in the same place. So if you need very low latency access to the data, uh, or very high throughput access to the data, this is one way to get it done. And it's using the same cloud business model as the storage. So you get what we call a ZCS engine, ZCS being the Zadara Container Services, and you can size that engine any way you see fit, from very small to very large. The smallest one is free. So we want our customers to experiment with this because okay. it's a new way of doing things. There's, there's, you know, there's not a, uh, there's not a uh, track record of running Docker inside storage. So we say, hey, g give it a try at no cost. And then larger engines cost an increasing amount of money per hour. So you can use it for an hour or two or a day or a month or a year, it doesn't matter. We charge you based on the actual usage. You can dynamically grow and shrink it. So let's say they have a task that has a shifting need in terms of the amount of resources that it consumes, no problem. You can auto scale it up or down and you can shut it down when you don't need it, when you're not using it. So just to be clear then, so what people are doing is basically writing their app as they would normally, but then they're deploying it to a particular Docker container, mm -hmm. that's the one that's sitting inside mm -hmm. the Zadar storage. Exactly, and by running Docker with a full-fledged storage system, you get some things that you don't get with traditional Docker. Because when Docker runs on the server, it gets access to the local storage, but it doesn't get shared storage. It doesn't get persistent storage, and doesn't get high availability storage. So for those uses where, where you don't need those, fine. So there are certainly plenty of uses for Docker where you, you have an ephemeral data set, right, and right. You, you don't need to keep it. These are sometimes called stateless applications. But as soon as you're stateful, all of a sudden there's a question. How do I do that? And this is, this is what we enable. So the, the data is persistent, uh, and, it, and it's high availability, and it's shared. So multiple Docker containers, and also multiple Docker containers and multiple VMs can access the same storage at the same time. It's pretty crazy. This thing just keeps keeps getting more and more virtualized, more and more virtualized. So I wonder. Um, so the other than kind of knock on Docker, there's some stuff on Twitter today. Is does it open up a new security hole? You know, some some had a great line. Are you willing to bet your job on mm -hmm. the security of of the container? So mm -hmm. how have you guys addressed that in terms of adding this new element into to your kind of controlled system? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and and we it's one of those things that that we get. Uh, because of our architecture. So the architect, we call our product the VPSA, the Virtual Private Storage Array, and the P in, pri in, in VPSA is, is very important because the privacy is achieved through dedicated resources. Each customer gets their own VPSA, one, one or more VPSAs, and each VPSA has dedicated CPUs, dedicated memory, dedicated drives, both SSDs and hard drives, and a dedicated network. So anything you do in the ZCS, in the Zadar Container Services, is inside your VPSA, which means it's running on dedicated cores with dedicated memory inside your private network, which means it's every, it's every bit as secure as whatever your network setup is, and it doesn't open up any new holes, because it lives within this bubble, if you will. Okay, okay. Um, do you have any, any uh, customers that have, that have put this to, uh, to use? Yeah, to the, talk about? 
Yeah, a number of them. And uh, <clears throat> we publicly talked about um, a company called Studio Tech, and they're out in North Carolina. And they are in the architectural uh, and construction space. And they, they're a service provider to these companies that deal with a lot of drawings and, and plans. Right. And those come in many different formats. And there needs to be a conversion from one format to other formats for anything that comes in. And that used to be done in batch fashion with the server running, running the, these conversion processes. And that's fine and good, but there are sometimes as many as a million of these files. And even one or two milliseconds of latency between the storage and the server add up to a lot of time. Right. So this, right. is, this is where, when we announced uh, to, to this customer that we're doing Docker containers, they jumped for joy. They said, this is, this is exactly what we need. So they already used Docker, so we, d we didn't have to introduce them to Docker, and they already containerized their conversion process, and now all they need to do is upload this container into the storage, and now the conversion is done both far, far faster, because now you're not multiplying a millisecond by a million files, but also it's automatic because it's event driven. The storage informs the container, a new file has arrived. What would you like to do? Right, right. Let's, let's do that process. Interesting. So I want to shift gears a little bit about, a, a little bit, um, just real simple stuff. You, you guys list 100% SLA, right? You're beyond the mm -hmm. nine. Is that accurate? Correct. So if, if a drive goes down in this uh, unit that's in my network, how do you guys, how does it get fixed? So, so for the, the very short and glib answer is it's not your problem, it's our problem. So the, the system is over provision, has a lot of spare drives, and in the event that a drive fails, two things happen. One is RAID protection kicks in, so you still have access to your data no right. matter what. Right. And then the other thing is, is a substitution of a healthy drive for an unhealthy one. And this can be done completely automatically and transparently in a matter of seconds, or you can do it manually with three commands, and you, and you can script it or anything like that. Most of our customers actually choose to do this manually because they don't want to pay for an extra drive that's on standby, because it's just three API commands to do a drive replacement, so they say, I'll, I'll just do that. It'll take me a minute instead of a second, but I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay. But the, the beauty of it is, to you, you have what looks like an infinite pool of drives. You, you can replace drives anytime for any reason. Maybe you want to change drive type or maybe a drive failed, and it's up to us to periodically uh, sweep through, take the bad drives out. Uh, for those customers who want it, we shred those drives, which is kind of... If you ever watched it, it's a really cool. It, it definitely like a big chipper. It's it's like a big chipper. It's a, for those of us with an appetite for destruction. It's right, really right. really cool. <laughs> um, and um, and then for other customers, we, uh, we just wipe them. I mean, in fact, the customers have the option to perform the wipe themselves. It's built into the system, which is good practice, right? Before you return a drive into circulation, you you want to make sure that it's clean. Right. Um, I want to delve into another another piece of the puzzle that I don't think a lot of people talk about, and, and you've talked about it before. Uh, when people are comparing kind of capex versus opex, and, and they're talking about you know uh, having these elastic systems that really move with your application demands, and, and you made a really interesting comment uh, on a prior interview talking about planning cycles. Mm -hmm. Right, everyone kind of forgets about budget planning cycles, except the sales guy when he's trying to make it close. Right, he knows that budget cycle pretty pretty well. But your budget cycles don't necessarily work with your planning cycle which don't necessarily work with the application uptake or your application delivery cycle, especially today in a world of Agile where people are pumping code out mm -hmm. like crazy. I wonder if you could talk about you know, some of the experiences that you have had with customers potentially that really see now the value of aligning uh, not only the, the, the purchase and the gear with the apps, but, but, but that painful process called <laughs> the budgeting cycle yes. <laughs> and the procurement cycle, which, which is real. Yes. So it, as you said, it's it's painful regardless of timing because you with the traditional capex model, you're buying something very expensive and you're stuck with it for years upon years. So you better choose the right thing, right. which means you have to do a lot of research. You have to f forecast your own needs, and then you have to compare your needs versus everything out there in the marketplace. It takes many months, and at the end, you're wrong anyway <laughs> because it's impossible to predict the future. Right. And, al and right. also, you're you you're so afraid of being caught short that you over-purchase. One of the things that showed up in the TCO study that we did, the total cost of ownership, is on top of all the other savings I mentioned, there's also the savings of not having to over-provision. You only pay for what you use, you never pay for idle capacity. Right. So that's yet another efficiency that we introduce. So very painful cycles, and you repeat every few years, right? It, it's uh, literally a Sisyphean effort. You roll the rock to the top of a hill, and then three to five years later, it's back at the bottom of a hill, and right. you, st you start over. But 
on top of that is what you mentioned is the is the the budgeting cycles. We have uh, one of our customers is Cal Poly. They're a university. They're part of the Cal State system. They're dependent on state funding, which comes only once a year. If they have a need in the middle of the budgeting cycle, too bad. You can't. So they, when they discovered us, they said, this is it. This is the solution. It's only OPEX. I don't have any, any upfront investment. Right. And I can source it whenever I need it. If I need more during the academic term, I use more. If I need less, right now they're off. It's summer. Guess what? Their system is idle. And they're paying a very small amount because they're not using it. It's perfect. So they, sa they save money and they, and they adjust to their actual real-time needs rather than to something that they thought they need a couple right, of years back. Right, right. Well, and, a, and a, a world where, you know, you had your SAP installation and you didn't really swap it out that often. You know, mm -hmm. the, you could at least have a little bit more accuracy on your forecasting on your demands because your transactional growth, your storage growth, all, all those things were at a much more predictable pace. But now things are just going bananas and mm -hmm. you just don't know and the demand for apps is just going crazy and then oh yeah there's this whole big data thing going mm -hmm. on in, in the background as well mm -hmm. so I wonder if, if you you know you've been at it for a while you guys are in the marketplace you're having some success um, what's kind of next where do you see kind of the next big wave big challenge big opportunity uh, both for Sadara but kind of in general as this market continues to move along this cycle so let's start with the market in general I I think we've now proven that as a service is what customers want. Uh, we prove it uh, not through market share because we're still, you know, we're, we're, st we're, we're on a very aggressive ramp, but we're still small by, by the larger scheme of things. But we, we've proven it by the kind of customers that we've uh, brought on board and by the, by the companies who didn't win the very same right. bids. Well, I would also add, or you could, and also by the applications in which you're supporting. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's probably a really important piece Yeah, of so that. we're talking about mainstream applications, mission, including mission critical applications at, at, at companies up to and including Fortune 100 and Fortune 50 companies. So I, I think it, we can now state with confidence, this is for real. And the challenge for the industry is to, to get with the program. There are companies who are resisting the as a service trend, and it's understandable. It requires retooling everything. So it's a, it's a monumental task. Right. And right. then there are companies who are service washing. So they say we're as a service. I, I just, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna name names, but a reporter in our industry wrote a recent story about as a service offerings. And when you read the story, all the companies mentioned do not offer an as a service offering. They may, they may provide some capacity on demand or some flexible pricing models, but they don't actually provide a service. So, so the parts of the industry still don't distinguish what uh, what is true as a service and, and what is not. And we talked about it in one of the previous interviews. The, to me, that's the lit litmus test. Right? Do you have the headache of ownership? If you do, that's not as a service. Right, right. Okay, so that's, so everyone's accepted it. Um, where does it go next? I, I, th I think it's going, I think it's going to sweep across. And some companies will adopt it faster. But where it goes next is IT in general, not just storage, but IT in general will be consumed using a cloud model because that's what companies need. Right. They, they need, to, and by the way, it'll, it'll cascade very quickly. If, if competitor X has the ability to be very agile, deploy new applications quickly, and serve their customers better and, and sooner, then competitor Y has to get with that program or else they'll be left behind. Right. So what we do is exactly that. We enable companies to decide what they want to do and then just do it. Whereas I'm, with the old model is, here's what I want to do, but here's what I can do. And they're not the same because I'm locked into an IT infrastructure that didn't anticipate what I need right now. Right, right. It, but, but then there's also kind of that locked in application and the stuff that runs on that infrastructure that for a lot of it's probably easy just to let it be, let it run. I always mm -hmm. go back to like the classic old airline reservation system when mm -hmm. you watch the when you watch the agent behind the counter right. tap into that system. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to change that out. That thing yeah. works just fine. Um, and then what about for Zazar? What what's kind of the next hill for you guys to climb? Uh, th our biggest challenge is scaling. So we're we're growing very quickly. I, you know, so uh, I became COO uh, in February of this year. We didn't have a COO until then, and and so our you know we. We needed to reach the next level of maturity and, and have, have the structure in place to keep growing at the pace that we've been growing. So when, when we look at it is, how, you know, we're in such a good position and the customers are so passionate about the product, it's how do we keep adding customers at the same pace, keep, and it, honestly, it's, it's really on us because when we go into a customer and they like the model, we win. There's not a good alternative 
for that. So that means we need to visit as many customers as possible. Right, right. Well, you just have to have the cube at the Zadar Summit. I saw you guys are all chilling out and uh, yeah. look like a very cold place to have a drink. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> With your jackets. All right, well, Noam, I'll give you the last word before before we let you go. What can we look forward to? I'm sure we'll see you again at, uh, at reInvent. You have mm -hmm. some exciting news that you're working on, some new things coming out. We, we have exciting news all the time, but, but we're going to focus, you know, in the anything takes time to adapt. So we're going to focus on Zadar Container Services. We're going to focus on backup to S3, both very popular features. And we will, I think you'll hear, hear us talking about those features and the adoption and actual customers using those more and more until we're ready for another feature announcement. So yeah. we, 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 try, we try not to move too quickly for the market because then we end up with, uh, with features that aren't being used. Right, well passionate customers are always your best sales, sales force and they are. we see that time and time again at, at the shows that we go to like at ServiceNow and Splunk and a lot of these places where they just have a parade of customers that are really excited about, mm -hmm. about using that technology because it's, it's really delivering value to them. So that's, uh, that's a good thing to keep working on. Excellent. Awesome. Well, uh, Noam Shandar, thanks for stopping by from Zadara Storage. Uh, you're watching Jeff Frick, Cube Conversation from Palo Alto. See you next time.